All right. Welcome, everyone, to today's Webmaster Central Office Hours Hangout. Uh, my name is John Mueller. I'm a search advocate at Google. And part of what we do is these kind of office hours and events where people can come to us and ask us questions around their website, around search. And we try to find answers or figure out what's happening to some extent. A um, bunch of things were submitted already uh, on, on the YouTube listing for, for the event. But if any of you want to get started with your first question, you're welcome to jump on in. Hey, John. Hi. Hey, um, I got a question regarding um, ranking. So I've written, I've written an article that ranked number one the day after it was posted. And it was with a feature snippet. But it, then it dropped to like page six within about more uh, 24 more hours. And um, decent amount of uh, search volume for the keyword. And then um, I verified the SERP on Google, Google Search Console, third party SEO tools, and then asked several, several people to verify the position. And um, does the ranking or the feature snippet mean anything or just uh, uh, Google indexing doing its work? And can I assume that um, at least the post is eligible for the feature snippet, snippet position? or the top ranking eventually, um, providing everything remains the same. Thank you. It's, it's hard to say. So it, it can happen that, that a, a piece of content appears very visibly in search uh, in the beginning, and then it settles down into a lower state. Uh, it can also happen that a piece of content starts off kind of low, and over time, uh, gets a higher ranking. Uh, and both of those situations are, from, from our point of view, essentially normal. Uh, so that's something where I wouldn't necessarily say there's a technical issue on your website or there's something problematic with those pages. Uh, it's essentially just how kind of ranking works. And it can happen that it goes back up, that over time we see, actually, this is a fantastic article. We should be showing it more. Uh, it can happen that we show it as a featured snippet. Uh, it, can also be that we show it as a featured snippet, even if it's not ranking first. So all of these things are, are possibilities. Um, one, one thing that I would generally recommend if you care about the visibility of this article, don't just kind of take it and say, oh, I'll leave it as it is and uh, hope that something changes in the future, but rather if you care about it, then continue working on it and continue trying to, to make it better so that uh, when we look at it again, we see, well, there's a lot of new information here. There's something really useful here that we do need to show more visibly. Thank you so much. Sure. John, good morning. Hi. Hi. Um, yeah, I've submitted a question regarding website with a uh, separate mobile version and uh, three language versions. and. Uh, the problem is uh, that in the desktop search, uh, Google shows mobile URLs uh, for the most important keywords. And uh, despite rel, uh, alternate and rel canonical are set correctly, and uh, in the Google Search Console, uh, no impressions for the mobile URLs are shown. Um, in addition to this, um, for some German searches, uh, English URLs show up in, uh, in the search. Uh, and hreflang is implemented for every language. So uh, I'm wondering what could be the problem here. OK. Um, I, I cheated. I, I looked at your, your issue beforehand. Uh, just so, so the, the people who are watching this don't think I have a crystal ball. Um, uh, and essentially, what, what is happening in, in your situation, you have the, the mobile version with separate mobile URLs and the different language versions. And you have different language versions for both desktop and for mobile. And uh, what, what is happening is your site is switched over to mobile-first indexing. So the primary version that we index for your pages is the mo mobile version. So kind of the, the M dot version of the, of the pages. I think you, you call them mobile in the subdirectory or something. It, it doesn't matter, M dot or like something else in between. So this is the primary version that we index. 
Uh, in general, when we recognize there is a desktop and a mobile version, we will swap out the URLs in the search results appropriately. Um, however, also when we recognize there are different language versions, uh, so uh, using hreflang, for example, then that's something where we would also swap out the URLs. So what is happening here is we swap out the URLs for the different language version, in your case, and we don't swap out the URLs for the desktop mobile version. Uh, so what, what is happening there is basically in Search Console, we count it as an impression for the primary version of the page. And we swap out the, the language version, and we show that to the user. And that's the mobile German version or the mobile English version. And uh, that's essentially what is, what is kind of happening there. Um, from talking with the, the mobile-first indexing and the internationalization team, they don't feel this is critical enough to kind of really work on and say, oh, we need to change our algorithms to figure this out better. Uh, but rather, what they recommend is that if you have a separate mobile version and a separate desktop version, that you redirect on both of those. So if a mobile version goes to the desktop page, redirect to the mobile version. I think you're doing that. Uh, but also, if a desktop user goes to the mobile page, then redirect to the desktop version. Uh, so if you add that redirect, then even if we show the mobile version in the search results, people will go to the appropriate version of the site. OK, thank you. And uh, regarding the, um, the language uh, version, so showing up English version for German searches, can we do something about that? Um, I, I think that's really tricky. I, I, did, I didn't see that in particular for your site. But I think I suspect that's for the, the brand name or the city name that, that mm -hmm. you have there. Yeah, I, I think that's really tricky there, because it's hard for us to recognize that this query is in German or in English, uh, because you're searching for that specific name. And it's the na same name in English and in German. Uh, so we probably primarily think, oh, the user settings are in German. We'll try to show the German page. But it could also be that the user is searching in English. We can't completely tell just based on the query. OK. Thanks a lot, John. Sure. Hey, John, can you hear me? Hi. Uh, starting September 22, our new articles have stopped indexing, and old articles are disappearing. When I check on inspection tool, it says duplicate canocial error. And Google has picked a completely different URL. So we are our traffic has time. Yeah. Um, I I don't know where where specifically that would be coming from. So that's something where it would be useful to uh, maybe have a forum thread with the details. Uh, yeah, I so. commented here. OK, cool. If you can drop the link to the forum thread in the comments here, I can take a look afterwards as well. Yeah, thanks. Sure. Hey, hi, John. Uh, hi. I, I, I need your advice on something related to images. So we got a lot of images on our website. And our pages load quite quick, quite quickly on uh, the normal networks or faster networks. But if the user is coming from a slower network, uh, say 3G network, so the page takes a lot of time to fully load, something somewhere around five to six seconds. So we're trying to fix this issue. And one of the solutions that tech team uh, suggested is that what if we just don't show those images to the people who are coming from slower network? So I need your advice. Can this impact our SEO? Um, not or probably not not directly because Googlebot will probably be crawling with something that you recognize as a kind of higher uh, bandwidth connection. Um, but what you can do in, in a case like this, instead of trying to recognize the user is coming from different locations, um, use something like, oh, I forgot, forgot what the name is, when, when you have different image files for the same image. Um, I think a source set is, is how you implement it. Uh, that might be something that you could implement there, so that uh, instead of not showing the image at all, you just have a very low resolution version of that image. Um, I'm not not completely sure how you would implement that just on the kind of the speed of the connection, 
uh, but that might be something to, to look into there. Sure, sure, I'll try. Yeah, but also, if, if you really recognize that these users can't use the full content of your pages, then uh, showing them a limited version is, is fine. Um, yeah, maybe that. Yeah, images are just part of the content, just to show that uh, the text part is there, just to show that the content is rich. And because we got a games website, and images are part of that. Yeah. So, I, yeah, I, I think if the images are critical for your pages, then I would find a way to show them in any case, even if you have to show like lower resolution or do something fancy that people click to get the full ver version. Uh, if images are just decorative on your website, then that's something I wouldn't worry about. But uh, in particular, if people go to your pages and they go there because of the screenshots that you show or because of the images that you show, then it shouldn't be that those images are just not shown. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. I, I think, Dejan, you had a question. Oh, we can't hear you. I don't know if your microphone is off. Ah, uh, I can't hear you. OK, maybe you can type it into the chat, or we can try again later. OK. John, can I just follow up on that uh, page speed image sure. question? Um, is it still the case that um, in Insights, it, it, one of the things it suggests for images is using the, the next gen formats? And yet, until recently, I haven't looked recently, but they weren't really supported by a lot of the browsers. It seemed to be that you were suggesting one thing, but browsers said no, we don't, we don't like those. Is that still the case, or has that been updated? I I don't know what which formats are currently listed there. So I think one one of the newer formats was WebP, and yeah. I I believe that's supported everywhere. Uh, but if you use Oh, I forgot forgot what the name was. Uh, I, I think it's a source set in for for images. If you specify different image files there with different formats, then the browser can pick the format that works for them. So even if you have like one version with WebP and the other version as as a GIF or JPEG or something, uh, then the browser will pick which one works best for them. Uh, so that means for for things like modern browsers like like Chrome, where we would pick up the speed, we'd be able to use the fast images. And if the browser has to use one of the fallback versions, then that still works. OK. But it also means that you have to kind of generate your images in different formats and sizes. So it's a little bit extra work. Some CMSs probably make that a little bit easier. OK. Tom. Cool. OK, let me run through some of the submitted questions. And uh, we'll definitely have more time afterwards if people want to hang around and ask more questions. Um, let's see. Uh, let's say we have a good article that we want to publish on several high traffic websites. So we send the article to the owners of those sites, asking them to publish it. Um, afterwards, 10 out of 30 websites publish our articles, but we also notice some unwanted websites have taken over the article and published it as well. Uh, so how does Google treat the backlink from the unwanted websites? Can this backlink harm us? Uh, should we disavow it? Uh, or is it considered a natural uh, behavior in the eyes of Google, and we should just keep the link and the article there too? Uh, so in general, we recommend not doing guest posting for link building. So that's something where if you're really only kind of sending this article out and trying to get it to other sites to get a link from that, that's something that, uh, if done at, on a high, high scale, is something that the web spam team would look at and say that this is not a collection of natural links, and maybe algorithmically or manually, we have to take action there. Uh, so that's kind of the first thing there. Uh, in general, though, if uh, you do have one article on, on multiple websites, then we, we will see that article on those multiple websites. And we will see those links there. And uh, if these are on websites that you don't 
kind of want that to be published on, then it's kind of up to you to take action there. And that can be using the disavow tool if you want. That might be contacting a site owner and asking them to take it down or using the DMCA process. That's essentially up to you. Um, the second part of the question is, how does Google treat the 10 out of 30 webmasters that decided to publish the same article? Is it considered duplicate content? Uh, yes, of course it is duplicate content, because it's the same article. Um, so essentially, what would happen in the search results is we would recognize that it's the same article being published multiple times, and we would try to pick one of them to show in the search results. And it can be that we show a version on one other person's website. It can be that we show the version from your website. It's not guaranteed that we would always show the version from your website. Uh, so if you syndicate your content, then you kind of have to live with the kind of aspect of, well, maybe Google will show a syndicated version instead of your version. And uh, essentially, the way to prevent that from happening is not to syndicate your content. Um, when auditing links for my clients' websites, I see some naked URLs that are pointing to valuable resources on the site. How does Google treat such links when there's no anchor text? Um, so I think by naked URL, it's basically just someone is linking with the URL as the anchor text. So in that situation, we see that URL as the anchor text. Uh, from what, what I understand, our systems do try to recognize this and say, well, this is just a URL that is linked. It's not that there's a valuable anchor here. Uh, so we can take this into account as a link, but we can't really use that anchor text uh, for anything in particular. Uh, so from, from that point of view, it's, it's a normal link, but we don't have any context there. Um, yes? So, uh, can Google kind of get context for like the text around that link, maybe, if it doesn't have any? Sure. But that's more kind of secondary. Like that, that really strong piece of context uh, from the anchor text that's missing in that case. And then like small things around the side, that does help us a little bit. Uh, but really, the, the kind of the primary aspect of, of that link is kind of gone. And I mean, usually, that doesn't matter. It's not that it counts against your website in any way. It's just, well, for this particular link, we don't really know. Uh, what what the context is? All right, I'm asking since the majority of organic links, so to speak, um, usually use either a branded anchor text, like the brand name of that website, mm -hmm. or something like the URL or nothing, uh, you know, specific not no keyword uh, uh, specific keywords being used. So. Uh, since that is the case, since the majority of the, the, of the links that point to a website aren't really uh, specific around the keywords that are related to that website, does Google use you know like the content around the, uh, or the topic of the article where that link is or things like that? Yeah, yeah. I mean that's something we we do definitely take into account, but it's it's very <laughs> secondary. So it's not. I mean. It, there is no kind of like value of strength for, for the context there. But I'd say it's like that anchor text is really obvious. And we can collect that. And we can look at that overall. And uh, kind of the context of the linking pages is something, well, it's like we also need to think about at some point. Uh, but right. the anchor text is really kind of the, the primary thing. Right, but it's also the anchor text that kind of also points you in cases where that link is doesn't seem to be very organic, because it's very like yeah, that's sometimes that. yeah. yeah sometimes yeah mm -hmm. okay. Um, I recently changed the layout, look and feel of my blog, and moved away from WordPress and now using Hugo Static Sites Generator for publishing my post. Uh, does a change in layout impact my ranking and search results? On this side note, there's no change in content and the URL structure. It's still the same as before. Uh, so changing the, lay the layout of your pages can affect your search results. So this is something that some people work on actively as well uh, with regards to on-page SEO. Uh, so things like 
figuring out how to use titles properly on a page, how to do internal linking properly, how to provide more context for the article itself. Uh, all of this can definitely affect SEO. So just because the kind of the primary content, like the blog posts that you have, and the URLs themselves don't change doesn't mean that there's nothing else around uh, all of that that search engines won't be able to pick up on. So it can definitely affect SEO. And it can be a good thing. It can be a bad thing. So it's not that you need to avoid making these changes, but rather, when you make these changes, make sure to double check that you're kind of doing everything really well. Um, my blog traffic is 99% from desktop, and I get very rare traffic from mobile and tablet. Uh, but sometimes I see the mobile usability issues, like clickable elements too close. Uh, should I be concerned more about that? Will it put a negative impact on my site's ranking uh, or search results for desktop? I optimize my website for mobile, and it's responsive as well. Uh, so. I, I think this is one of those uh, aspects where sometimes our systems see fluctuations in how we process the pages. And uh, that can result in things like the mobile usability report in Search Console saying, oh, I found a number of pages that are not really mobile friendly. And if you check those pages manually and you see that they are actually mobile friendly, then I would just leave it at that. That's basically our systems, for whatever reason, at one point were not able to render your pages properly. Uh, so we wanted to let you know about that ahead of time. Uh, if you see that the majority of your pages are recognized as not being mobile friendly, then I would definitely take a look at that. If it's just individual pages every now and then, that's perfectly fine. Uh, with regards to mobile friendliness in general, with regards to a site that is mostly visible on the desktop search results, uh, the mobile friendliness is a factor that we use in mobile search results particularly. It's not something that we currently use for the desktop search results. So uh, if, for example, your site were actively not mobile friendly, like you, you never worked on mobile friendliness, and it's a table-based layout, and you have to zoom in, and everything is really hard to use on mobile, but nobody is searching for your site on mobile, then that's also kind of fine. Uh, the thing to watch out for there, though, is it might just be that nobody is using your site on mobile because it's not mobile friendly. So that's. One of the things, especially in the beginning, as uh, everything around mobile came up, um, even on the Search Console side, the Search Console team was like, well, we don't have to make our site mobile friendly because nobody is using Search Console on their mobile phone. And of course, if you can't use it on your mobile phone, then nobody will use it. So you kind of have to avoid uh, running into that situation. Um, I've been a webmaster and SEO professional since 2001. I have a hypothesis that I'm hoping you can confirm or deny. Uh-oh. Uh, I'm wondering if referral traffic from organic backlinks and referring domains play a part in the legitimacy, trust, and authority when it comes to the PageRank algorithm. Uh, it seems to me that a backlink that is never clicked on would be less useful than one that does. Uh, therefore, a backlink that is actually active actually used by visitors uh, may be counted or regarded with higher trust or authority. And since the purpose of the backlink is to drive traffic, if some backlinks never drive traffic by way of referrals, why would they matter? Um, yeah, I, I think this is an interesting question. It comes up every now and then. Um, essentially, in our algorithms, we don't look at that. So it's not uh, that we, we kind of monitor what people actively click on and see how the traffic goes back and forth. Uh, there are lots of reasons for traffic to go to a website that is completely unrelated to SEO. Uh, so from that point of view, uh, it's something where I think, as a site owner, it's useful to think about where your traffic is coming from. And if you see a lot of your traffic is coming from some particular sites, then that might be a sign that maybe there's something you can do together with that website to, to make it work even better. Maybe that's a sign you could work with other websites to make it better there. Um, maybe it's a sign that uh, there's a large overlap of audience uh, between those two websites. Uh, but just because there's traffic coming or there's no traffic coming from individual links doesn't play a role in, in our algorithms. Uh, in particular, with regards to PageRank, PageRank is really 
kind of a, a simple algorithm that is just complicated because of the scale of the internet. Uh, but that's something where we try to essentially just focus on the link. So it's not that there's any anything special also kind of flowing into that. Uh, so from that point of view, if you have links to your site that nobody is clicking on, that can be perfectly fine. Um, it can also be something where you might say, well, it's like, why do I have these links from these sites? If nobody's actually using them, then maybe like that link is just hard to find, or maybe there's kind of a mismatch with the audiences there. Uh, but essentially, that doesn't play into the SEO side of things. Uh, if my original site is faster than the AMP version, do I still do you still recommend having an AMP version? Um, that's that's an interesting question. So I, I think if you have an, a site that is faster than the AMP version, then to, to me, that would point at the AMP version being kind of a suboptimal version. Uh, because in general, AMP is really optimized for, for really fast delivery, especially if you're using the AMP cache. If something is being served from the, the cache uh, directly, then from my point of view, that unless you're doing something really weird with those AMP pages, that should be really fast. Uh, that said, um, there, there are multiple reasons to use AMP. Speed is definitely one of them. If speed is the only reason that you're using AMP pages, then of course, feel free to just use your own version. Um, that's something where it's, it's really up to you. Um, other people some might decide to just say, well, I will just use the AMP version and make my AMP version the fastest one possible so that you don't have to work on both of them. That's also an, an, an a way to kind of deal with that. Uh, but in general, like if you really are only doing AMP for speed and your normal responsive pages are just as fast or faster than your AMP versions, then like that seems like one place where you could optimize. Uh, with regards to uh, some of the features where we do show AMP pages, um, that's something where we recently announced with I think the page experience, page experience uh, ranking factor that we would start taking into account pages that are not AMP as well, uh, provided they kind of reach that same threshold with regards to the uh, core web vitals. So uh, at some point in the future, it's not the case at the moment for things like the top stories uh, feature. If your pages are really fast and they kind of reach the core web vitals factors, then we would also show them there, even if they're not AMP versions. Uh, what is Google's vision of the future of its search engine? There have been multiple, there have been a few changes in recent times with all the extra boxes in the search results page that make me wonder what they're driving towards. They seem to me to be aiming at or preparing something new for the future. Wow, I, I don't know what what the big future vision is. Uh, with regards to, to search, it feels like we could probably have a long uh, session just speculating on different topics. So I don't really know what, what I can tell you here. Uh, I think the important part to keep in mind is that we make changes all the time. And we, we try a lot of things out, as I think pretty much every website should do. And uh, that's something where if you try a lot of things out, if you try some risky things along the way as well, then you'll see which things work out and which things don't work out so well. Uh, so for example, for last year, I think, I don't know, we did over 100,000 uh, tests and experiments with different things over the course of a year. And it led to something like, I don't know, 3,500 changes in the search results. So, uh, that's something where it's like you say you've seen a few changes in recent times. There are lots of changes happening all the time. Some of those changes are very small, that just like small pixels shift around or the colors slightly change. Some of them are fairly visible. And we, we have to keep testing. We have to keep uh, improving things because people online, they expect even better things all the time. Uh, it's not the case that you can just keep one thing stable and it'll be relevant forever. Um, how does Google treat blogs that are built on expired domains? Is it a recommended practice? Uh, so 
in general, I wouldn't recommend using expired domains as a way, as a kind of an SEO strategy. That seems very risky. Uh, sometimes the, these domains, uh, on the one hand, can be quite expensive. And sometimes you might be getting a lot of uh, extra cruft with that expired domain. Uh, so we, we do try to recognize when a new site is being built on an expired domain, and we try to ignore as much of the past as possible. Um, however, if the old version that, of the site that used to be there on the previous kind of owner uh, was something that was really problematic, for example, they built a lot of links in, in ways that were against our webmaster guidelines, then that's something that can still be associated with your website. And that's something that you probably need to clean up before you can really be sure that you're starting with a clean slate. Uh, so my recommendation there would be, as much as possible, if you really want to dive all in on a domain name, then investigate its past uh, so that you kind of know what you're getting involved in. And if you're doing this just to kind of try something risky and you don't need to rely on it for your business, then like, feel, feel free to try things out. Uh, but if your business really relies on it, then investigate the past and make sure that you understand what it is that you'll need to clean up at some point to get back to a clean slate and whether that's worth it for you overall. Um, John, do you, do you differentiate between domains that have actually expired, though, and just someone taking over another domain? Like it has to have expired at the registrar. Um, that's sometimes really hard to tell um, because uh, of, of the way that the, the registrars work and what information they provide publicly. So that's, I mean, what we try to recognize is there is essentially a new site here. And uh, we also try to recognize situations where people take an expired domain, they go to archive.org, and they download the old version of the site, and they put it back up, and they add five new links uh, along the way and try to make it look like, oh, this is just like, you know, I forgot to renew my domain, and it's all the same now. Uh, that's, I, I don't know, it's, it's been a practice since forever. Um, but th these are things that we try to recognize from a web spam point of view and also just generally from a kind of a general ranking point of view to make sure that as much as possible people can <coughs> reuse domain names, uh, but also that kind of the cruft and the extra value that was associated with the old net domain is, is kind of neutralized as much as possible. Sometimes we can't do that completely. Like If there are really lots of problematic links there, then sometimes that's just kind of like the last thing. Are you trying to neutralize problems or, or neutralize benefits? Because, oh, because if you're yeah. in the real world, if you, if you own, a, I don't know, a restaurant chain and you buy another restaurant chain and you you then have more sites. You might want to close some and just merge them, fire half the staff, and get economies of scale. Is that not? Why is that not the, the case in the online world, where you still have all of those links coming in, which are now pointing to your new business and and offer the same value? If it's a genuine takeover, you're diminishing the value in the business you've just purchased for no reason. It's, it's hard. It's hard. Uh, I, I mean, a lot of these, so what we do try to recognize is when things are essentially kind of just being taken over and the business continues to run normally, where essentially it's just kind of like a change of ownership situation, um, but it's essentially the same business. That's something we, we do try to say, well, that seems like a reasonable change. That, that can happen. Um, but a lot of times, the reuse of expired domains is essentially it's like one business goes bankrupt, and uh, the business stands still for a while. And then someone else goes there and says, oh, actually, I'm Rob's business, and I'm just the new owner kind of thing. Like, treat me as if I, I were still a legitimate business. Which, 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 which isn't that right, though? 
if you do that in the real world, the the roads going into your business and the signs that used to be there and the previous PR you had, you can take over bankrupt businesses. It happens all the time to utilize their assets. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Um, it's, Otherwise, it's every tricky. bankrupt business is worthless and the, there'd be no, there would be no yeah. benefit in buying bankrupt assets. It's, it's tricky. Um, I, I wasn't planning on doing this, by the way, and just it just feels oh. like a, a real world situation is, is usually the best way to judge an online situation. Would you do it in the real world? No, then probably don't do it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's also something that we, we just see at scale a lot of times that people go off and it's like, oh, I can buy a thousand expired domain names and I'll look up the links to those domain names ahead of time and I'll just buy them all and redirect them to my site. Yeah, that's, that's something where from our point of view, it's not that your site has gained any value any more relevance because of that. It's really just, well, you're, you're taking a lot of expired domains and then redirecting them to your site. And that's something we shouldn't really kind of treat as being a part of your site. Okay. I, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I can see both sides, but it's something where the legitimate side where I'd say like this matches kind of like what would happen in, in the offline world and like a business should be able to do this. That's something that is significantly rarer than the, the other side where people just take expired domain names and try to reuse them. Right, because the barriers to entry in that in the online world are almost zero where it takes some effort to go buy a bankrupt business. Yeah, yeah, probably. In the real world. Yeah, exactly. yeah. And this is something that is, is sometimes has really weird effects in that people will buy expired domain names from conferences where it's like, I don't know, the, some, some scientific conference 2014 and you go to the website and they're selling, I don't know, fitness equipment now. And you're like, okay, I, why? Why did you like, essentially act like you're in a conference but you're selling something completely different now? Yeah, but that, that would be the same in the real world. If I bought a restaurant chain and turned it into a gym, I wouldn't expect to still serve restaurant customers. Yeah, but I mean, in that case, you would be like, well, actually, it's, it's a gym now, and you can't, you can't <laughs> kind of build off of the reputation you have as a restaurant. I mean, I, I'm sure there are ways you could twist that and say, like, well, actually, this is the gym for the old restaurant. Or, I don't know. Right. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> OK, wow. Yeah, I think with expired domain names, it feels like one of those topics that there's so many different aspects there. But no. Yeah. <sighs> OK, let's see. Um, in my Search Console, I'm noticing a continuous uh, decrement in mobile-friendly pages. When I inspect the pages in mobile-friendly testing tool, all of the, my pages were mobile-friendly. I haven't changed anything on my site. Um, why, what's the reason behind the continuous decline in mobile-friendly pages on my website? What should I do to overcome that? Uh, so one of the things to keep in mind is that the aggregate reports in Search Console, like the mobile-friendly report, uh, the structured data report, I think the speed report as well, uh, they're based on a part of your website. So it's not that these are all of the index pages from your website or that it's your whole website that's listed there. It's just a sample of the pages from your website. And it can happen that that sample becomes smaller. And that doesn't mean that you have fewer pages that are mobile friendly. It's just in that report, uh, we're just showing fewer pages in that report. And uh, what I would recommend doing there is Continue to double check your pages individually so that you're sure that things are OK. But if you don't see a rise in errors in that report, then I would just assume that, well, for this sample, we've determined that these are all mobile friendly. And we might be showing you a smaller sample of pages there, but that's perfectly fine. So in short, this is not something that you need to fix in any particular way. Uh, just make sure that like, that sample is, is all OK, that things are OK there. 
Um, how deep is the bond be between top stories and Google News old algorithm? I see top story being tested in the News tab on Search. Um, I don't know what, what you mean with how deep is the bond between these different elements. Uh, we, we do have different uh, elements that we show in the search results. And I could imagine that we would show some of these across the, the news in search and maybe also in Google News as well. Uh, so that from that point of view, it's not that there is a, a deep connection between all of these things or a, a, anything that can be quantified. It's just for practical reasons. If we recognize that one UI element works really well for users, maybe we'll use it in other places. Uh, so that's something that can happen. Um, our website was affected by a hack, and we've been dealing with it on and off for two weeks. Uh, things got cleared out, and, and when they popped back up, uh, we're in the clear now from the hack. But I've noticed our ranking has dropped for some of our strongest keywords during all of this. What are some best practices I should be following to get our site to be viewed as reputable by Google again quickly? Do I need to resubmit the sitemap since one of the hacks messed with ours? Uh, I repaired with it, but I'm not sure if I should resubmit. Um, I would definitely resubmit the sitemap uh, because that's just generally something that helps us to understand your site better. And if you're using a common CMS to generate that sitemap file, then probably it's already been resubmitted automatically. So probably that's already OK. Uh, in general, if you're faced with a situation where someone is actively hacking your website for a longer period of time, and I think two to three weeks or so, is something I would kind of quantify as a longer period of time, then it would be normal for our algorithms to be a little bit confused about what it is that you're trying to host on your website and what you want to rank for. Uh, so that's something where I can definitely see our algorithm saying, well, we don't really know what we should be showing this website for. And probably during that time, the ranking for the keywords that you do care about goes down. It's possible that maybe ranking for keywords that you don't care about goes up. Uh, in particular, if people add things to your website. So if a hacker is using your site to not redirect to other people's sites, but rather to host kind of hack content, uh, then that's possible that our systems will be like, on the one hand, maybe we'll show you for. I don't know, athletic shoes, because that's what the hacker placed there. And then when we recognize that it's actually hack content, we'll show you for less, uh, less fewer of these searches overall. Uh, in general, the important thing that uh, you really, really need to do is make sure that you've cleaned up the whole hack completely, uh, that you've done things like remove any owners that uh, the hacker has, has added to Search Console or to Analytics. Uh, so that you're really making sure that you're starting with a really clean slate. Uh, make sure that the security issues that were used to get in are really cleaned up. And uh, then clean out all of the hack content. And that includes checking things like the server control files, where sometimes there are redirects that are placed there that are only visible to search engines. Uh, also double checking all of the index pages, of course, so that you're sure that all of those are cleaned up. And I would also double check your server logs to make sure that there's really no traffic going to pages that you don't want to have indexed. Uh, for example, one thing we sometimes see with hacked sites is that they're used for phishing attacks. And uh, phishing content is often not indexed by, by Google because it, maybe it has a no index on there. Uh, but if people are using your site to host phishing content that they use for Gmail, for example, uh, then that's something you, you might not be seeing directly in, in your search results. Uh, so all of these things I would definitely clean out. And once it's all cleaned out, uh, once you've resubmitted your sitemap file, um, that's something where I would say it's probably a matter of a few weeks or so for things to settle down again. And uh, it is frustrating to be hacked like this. It's something that uh, kind of really pulls things down and is annoying, and it's hard to clean up sometimes. But uh, it, it just takes a bit of time for things to settle back down again. Uh, but 
with with all of these things, if you do clean up the the hacked content on your site, it will settle back down. It's not uh, something where Google will hold a grudge and say, "Oh, you were hacked once, therefore we cannot trust your website ever again." Lots of websites get hacked. That's something that unfortunately happens. Uh, John, I've got a question uh, about site colon searches. Okay. Um, so you're trying. We're trying to look at the performance of a particular product category, a set of product category pages that, that would include pagination, would include uh, some facets, so maybe along with the category, you have a selection for brand. And you have a lot of those indexed, dozens, maybe hundreds. Um, and if you were to choose to uh, place a no index on those pages, would you be sending Google a signal to then not index the products that exist on those pages? Well, uh, what would happen to the products that would list it, that would be listed on those pages? So you have a category page, and you from there you link page, to the products. Pagination. Google's mm -hmm. indexing all of those pages. Pagination, uh, some facets, um, but somebody's concerned that you have too many of these category pages indexed, uh, knowing that these category pages have the products listed. And if you were to know index those pages, what would be the end result of those products uh, being indexed? Yeah, OK. Um, so what, what would usually happen if you, if you have category pages and pagination on those category pages, and you, for example, no index everything from page two onwards, uh, what would usually happen is we would start to drop those pages from our index. Uh, and uh, when we drop those pages from our index, we would essentially drop those links as well. Uh, so probably if you put a no index on page two, uh, then it would be less likely that we would even go to page three to figure out like what is even shown there. So that's kind of one aspect there. It's possible that we'd still notice some of the links on page two, but kind of everything linked further back would be a lot harder to find. Uh, with regards to e-commerce sites, sometimes that doesn't matter so much, because a lot of times products are in different categories, or you have products that are cross-linked with kind of related product links. Uh, so what I would recommend doing there is first double-checking to see that we can still find all of your products but if we ignore the no-index pages. Uh, often you can do that with like a local crawler, something like Screaming Frog or some online crawler to kind of test your site and just make sure that with the noindex in place, we can still find all of your products. If we can't find your products with the noindex in place, then that's definitely something to watch out for. Perfect. In, Thank you. In, in general, our recommendation, though, is to allow the indexing of the paginated category pages and only disallow the indexing of things like facets. So if you have different sort filters or uh, kind of different filters for sizes or kind of sub-attributes of those products, that's something I would know index. But uh, the main category pages, I would allow indexing of those. So you wouldn't see value in, uh, again, s simplified. I'm not, not throwing out all of our facets for Google to crawl, but just a select few. So for example, the category and brand combinations, would, would you recommend not allowing Google to go to those? So it's, it can be really tricky with e-commerce, because on the one hand, it's, it's about crawling to find those pages. On the other hand, these can also be valuable landing pages. Uh, so if in any case you're saying this is a valuable landing page for me, it's like someone is searching for men's athletic shoes in blue, and this is a really popular query for your site, then keeping that facet available for indexing makes a lot of sense. Like People are searching for it explicitly. You have a good landing page for it. Definitely keep that. On the okay. other hand, if this is just really just for usability, if like nobody is searching for this particular facet, and you just have it for usability there, then that's something I would disallow indexing of. OK. Thank you. 
in addition to that, John, we can also do canon rel canonical tag, right? Instead of just no indexing, basically. Yeah, I I think you can do you can do pretty much both of those. From from my point of view, I I think it makes more sense to to use no index for for those kind of things because that gives you a clearer mental model. Uh, what we often see is people use rel canonical on the pages that they don't want to have indexed. And from our point of view, we will look at that and say, oh, you're saying these pages are equivalent. And mm. we could probably pick one or the other to show in the index. And okay. uh, that's not really what you're saying. You're kind of saying, well, just don't index this page. Uh, so that's for, for content that's not really identical, I would just use a no index and not the rel canonical. And I'm sure this will lead to lots of long discussions online now. <laughs> All right, thanks. Sure. John, can I try? Can you hear me? Sure, yes. Sorry for the previous uh, uh, problems. No. I have a question that maybe is, has been asked many times. It's about uh, cloaking. We have a dynamic website which is not indexed at all, and uh, in the cache, uh, the text version is completely empty, which means that uh, I, I think that maybe I can uh, take the HTML uh, with uh, property or something like that and uh, just uh, see if, if Google bot or any other bot is coming, I can serve this page. And for any other, if it's not a Google bot, I, I can just give the, the dynamic and actual version of the website. How bad is that? That's, that's perfectly fine. So we call that either server-side rendering or mm -hmm. dy dynamic serving, I think we, we call that, uh, depending on how you have that set up. And that's, that's perfectly acceptable as an approach. Um, one thing I would just caution against is just because the cache page is empty doesn't mean that Google is not able to index the content. Uh, so sometimes what, what usually happens with JavaScript-based sites is the cache page shows the HTML version of the page that we have. And if the JavaScript can't run on the URLs that we use for the cache page, then it doesn't show any content. Uh, but you can double check that by taking some of the content and just explicitly searching for that in Google. And if you see those pages showing up, then that's a sign we can find the content. And I wouldn't worry about the cache page in that situation. No, it, it was just like, uh, like an indicator what is happening because uh, uh, it's ov ov obviously something is wrong. I, I was just curious can we. Uh, apply this and I would just want to uh, safeguard that we are not uh, cloaking uh, like accused of cloaking because if we do that we'll do it with cron job like uh, every 24 hours and it won't be fully dynamic and every manual check on the web page will see okay this is not what is the life thank you very yeah. much John. Yeah, uh, we, we have that documented so if you need to point something like for I don't mm -hmm. know whoever makes decisions on your website. Uh, we, we have documentation on that in the search developer documentation uh, on how you can set that up with JavaScript. So we would definitely not see that as cloaking because the content that's shown in the end is the same. Okay. Uh, it's, it's just the delivery method is slightly different. What we would consider cloaking is if the content is very different. It's like okay. when you go to the page and show shoes and Googlebot sees I don't know, something completely different, like mm -hmm. vacation photos or something. That, that would be considered cloaking. OK. Uh, what about uh, if uh, there's some, uh, uh, the, co the content depends on the app request, uh, does uh, the bot wait? How long it waits for? Is it wait for network idle? We, we don't have a specific time that we wait there. Uh, we essentially try to see until nothing more changes on a page. And uh, that's, on the one hand, we, we have some hard timeouts. On the other hand, we try to figure out when, when things stop changing. The difficulty with waiting is that we use a lot of caching on our side. And 
we don't run Chrome with kind of the same speed setup as a normal user would. So you can't really compare how Googlebot would uh, wait for that page to how a user would see okay. it. Uh, the Inspect URL tool in Search Console gives you kind of an idea of what, what Google would show. Thank you very much, John, for your answer. Sure. I, I don't leave you because I'm technically at work, so <laughs> by all. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. All right. Any more questions before we pause the recording? I, I have a question. OK. Um, we, with our new site, we have um, the ability now to have dates booked. So it's, there's live inventory of dates. So in our meta information, that's now sometimes pulling through, saying, next available on the 1st of October. And that looks nice in the search results because people can you know, probably improve click-through for people that are interested. But the problem is, obviously, of course, if that stays there until the 2nd of October and Google doesn't index it again in the meantime, then it looks like an expired search result and it's probably worse. Have you, have you seen this sort of thing before and how any other people deal with that problem where there's dynamic content and therefore might be dynamic meta information? And so how do people deal with that? Or can we just ask you to index it every 20 minutes? Every 20 minutes. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I, I think that's easy to do on a small website and really challenging on a large website. Uh, so we. We see that a lot, or I don't know, a lot. We, we sometimes see that with e-commerce websites, for example, uh, if they go through and they change their prices significantly in a short term. Like, I don't know, for Black Friday, uh, suddenly all the prices are 10% lower. Uh, then that's something where we would need to essentially recrawl all of the products to see those changes. And uh, for that, we, we don't have any special method available there. It's really in the sitemap file, you have to tell us this page has changed. And then we may go off and recrawl that page. And sometimes we recrawl it fairly quickly after you tell us about it. Sometimes we recrawl it a month later. Uh, so that's something where. On, on the one hand, you can help us by optimizing what you allow us to crawl. Uh, so having a really clean URL structure where we don't end up kind of getting lost in variations of URLs helps a lot. Uh, having a fast server so that we can crawl a lot helps a lot. Uh, but it doesn't guarantee that we will pick up all changes immediately. If you're seeing that this happens regularly, or you make these changes fairly quickly, like you have something that's not happening next month, but rather it's like always a couple days ahead of, of things, then you could also use the uh, data no snippet attribute uh, in HTML, where you say, well, actually, this particular thing is something that is very dynamic. I don't want you to show it in the snippet. And then you kind of don't have the advantage of being there with kind of a date in the near future, but you also don't have the disadvantage if it's still indexed at some point later on. And you can use that for, for dates, for anything on the page. You can use that for prices, for something that's shown in the structured data. Uh, for anything that you don't want to have shown in the snippet, you can let us know about it like that. And is there markup for dates that would help if we really wanted it to be? Um, there is some markup for dates, but uh, it's it's mostly based on kind of what you want to provide as the article date. So if you're writing a blog post or an article and you have like today's date as a change on there for event dates or ticket sellers. Yeah. So for events, you could probably use the event markup. Maybe that would work if you have specific dates where you say this is taking place on this date at that time. We're pulling the the dates through via an API for live ticketing feed, so it, it is accurate. So that, we could do that. Yeah, that that sounds a good thing. Yeah. Okay. And with with the event markup, if we recognize that, then we can show that kind of as a rich result under the result. Sometimes we also show it in the sidebar, where if you're searching for a specific event, then in the sidebar it'll be like. This is happening at that date, and then it links to your pages. So. They're not specific events because they happen every week. 
you know, there's a cooking class every week or a skydive every week, but um, and yet they kind of are specific because they're always happening on a certain date. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Sure. Thanks. Okay. All right. Maybe we can take a break here. I'll pause the recording. If any of you want to stick around, you're welcome to stay a bit longer. Um, thank you all for joining. I hope you all found this useful. Uh, lots of good questions here. So thanks for asking all of that. And uh, hopefully, I'll see you again in one of the future Office Hours Hangouts. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.